Okay, we are live now. Thanks, Amber. <clears throat> Welcome everyone this afternoon to the meeting. And we see we have some guests, so that's great. And we will call the meeting to order, uh, which is the uh, meeting of the whole February 22nd, regular open agenda. And is there any declaration of peculiar interest in nature thereof from anyone? Don't see any? Good, okay. Adoption of the open session agenda. It resolved that the Committee of the Whole does hereby approve of the open session agenda dated February 22nd, 2022, as presented as a mover and a seconder. Moved by uh, Val, seconded by John. All those in favor? Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, minutes of the previous session. Uh, Committee of the Whole, January 18th, 2022, minutes. We had resolved that the Committee of the Whole does hereby approve of the minutes of the Committee of the Whole meeting held on January the 18th, 2022, as presented. A mover and a seconder. Second by uh, Councilor Wicken. Uh, moved by Councilor Wicken, second by Councilor Tracy McGill. Any questions on those minutes? I think everything that was in the minutes will be will come forward if it needs to. All those in favor? Oh, that's carried, thank you. And there's no one for each business. Well, 2021 annual report Bancroft Water Treatment Plant. Uh, I'll read the first resolution. Bid resolved that the Committee of the Whole has hereby received the 2021 annual report for the Bancroft Water Treatment Plant for information purposes. I'll have a mover and a second for that, please. Moved by Val, seconded by John. Um, Okay, I think it's Perry. Are you speaking on that first, Perry? Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor Mullet, and everyone this afternoon. This is just a uh, just an intro into uh, the uh, the actual complete annual water report that we will have Dwayne and uh, um, his staff Ashley uh, go through the uh, the whole annual report. Um, this is a very detailed report. Uh, it also it has all the operational processes and record keepings of the workings of the water treatment plant, and uh, we have uh, inspections done annually uh, to do, to give us this annual report of uh, everything, right from minor maintenance to water breaks to any type of uh, new. Uh, water main that has been installed and so on and so forth. So I'll uh, pass over the, uh, the mic to Dwayne and Ashley as they feel fit to, to go through this uh, annual report. All right, thanks, Perry. Hello, everyone. Hey, Dwayne, welcome to the meeting and Ashley. Just get, uh, might as well just get started right into this, get Amber to put that uh, report up on the screen. Oh, very good. Um, you don't need a lot of introduction into the water plant itself. It's, uh, uh, I mean, the, the intro was there. It was uh, constructed in 82 and it was upgraded or re-rated back then to 3380 cubic meters per day. Uh, we take water from Clark Lake and it's gravity fed through the, through the plant and through the town uh, up to the standpipe. So it's all gravity feed, which is uh, which is pretty nice. Um, there are two small boosters pump stations, um, one on uh, <clears throat> Bridge Street West and the other at Forest Hill. As you can see, there's a flow schematic there of how or a profile of the uh, of the town and the and how the system works. Clark Lake being the highest elevation, the plant the next highest, of course, and then you can see how. The elevations go through the town to the standpipe and then you can see the two booster stations over to the far left number one and two there so you can see how they're needed to uh, supply uh, enough pressure and water to uh, to uh, rich street west and uh, forest hill area the uh, water treatment plant consists of two parallel ecodyne package plants so basically they're uh, system that you can buy, not off the shelf sort of, but they are a package plant and uh, they 
uh, dual media, sand and anthracite. Um, and uh, we use chemical for um, coagulation. We use chemical for pH adjustment and uh, sodium hypochlorite for disinfection. And the plant does have backup power. Uh, you know the history of Veolia. We took over the project in uh, December 2017 from Aqua. And uh, so that's, that's where we're at. So if you want to just keep scrolling down. So operational summary, uh, every system has a uh, operating permit. Um, and uh, so this is uh, our operating permit number. I just thought I'd display that for you. Do you see that uh, we, we are in compliance? Um, the, the permit became effective in March of 2020. And uh, it does renew every so often. So uh, we'll have to uh, probably next year, the following year, it'll probably get renewed again. So, all right, raw water and uh, treated water flow summaries. Um, we're gonna uh, show the trends for the year. Um, you can ask questions, certainly just interrupt me anytime you want with regards to questions. Uh, annual raw water flow, you can see the numbers here. Um, certain times of the year, it goes up a little bit, but it's pretty consistent throughout the year. Um, May had a, a spike, March had a spike. I would assuming those spikes have something to do with perhaps a water main break or something. And of course, some summertime, we get uh, some spikes in summer usage as well. Comment, Dwayne? Wayne, yep. Wayne. Council Wiggins, just uh, looking at that total flows, it appears like the summer lawn maintenance doesn't have a major effect on us. Uh, I would think not because of the, most likely because of the prices of the, uh, of the water usage. Uh, people refrain from doing a lot of uh, lawn watering. I know I did some last year because I had some new seed down and our bill went skyrocketing. So, uh, yeah, you don't do a whole lot of it, though. A lot of people don't use a lot of water for uh, for lawn watering anymore. Also, do we not have uh, one side of the river one day and one the other? I don't know what the uh, the rules are for. Uh, Is that it, Perry? Town of Bancroft. Ah, uh, yes, Councillor Wiggins. We put that notification out in the spring of every year. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Rotate, ro certainly rotating uh, usage like that certainly helps the overall um, volume. That's for sure. Yeah. Thank you. And you can see by the uh, flow chart here, uh, maximum flows are in the red, minimum flows are the green, and the average daily flows are the blue. So pretty consistent throughout the entire year on raw water usage, raw water flows. All right. Um, these are the treated water flows, so you can see that the number is different by about 13,000 cubic meters, uh, 290,000 versus 303,000 on the raw water side. Those losses are uh, basically from backwashes within the facility itself. Um, I'm pretty sure Ashley would agree with that, that the backwashes take up probably almost all of that uh, flow from the 13,000 difference. Yes, I agree with that for sure. And the treated water flow uh, graph here, again, the same color codes, uh, red is the max, green is the min, and blue is the average. And it's again, pretty consistent from beginning of the year to the end of the year. All right, now we're gonna talk about filter performance. So the performance of the filters is necessary um, to have good filtration. Um, the backwash is initiated at, uh, as a turbidity reaches 0 0.08 NTUs. Um, so um, when the filter, when we get a 0 0.08, the filter automatically starts to backwash, which means water comes up through the sand and anthracite and makes it uh, suspended. Uh, the, the yucky materials that have settled on the sand and anthracite get washed out into the uh, waste tank. And then uh, after a little while, it all settles back down. 
uh, the uh, filter settle back down and we get a better uh, turbidity. Uh, there are alarms set points. We do not want to go above 0.29. Uh, if we go above 0.29, then it becomes a uh, not quite. Is it reportable at 0.3, Ashley? Point, or is it one? Um, so it's a recordable if it lasts for over 15 minutes, or we have three spikes of 0.3 within a rolling 15 minute period. Okay. So very good. Thank you. So you can see the filter turbidity table there filter one, filter two. Pretty consistent throughout the year. There are a couple of high spots. August is a high one, um, most likely because of turnover. Uh, when the water gets, when the raw water gets, uh, should I say, warm, it starts to turn over inside the lake um, and influent uh, turbidity comes up, which means filter turbidity comes up, which means you have to adjust your chemical to accommodate that. So sometimes you get a little higher these, but uh, most of all, we are well below uh, requirements. And I don't think we've had any alarms. We did have a couple of high spikes on the high side of the maximums, but that's, that's expected. And we have uh, graphs of the two, uh, two filters. As you can see, the high, when you do the comparison of the high from filter one to filter two, you're going to notice it's a little higher. And uh, the reason for that is that the filter one media needs to be changed. And we're in the process of changing that out probably at the start of next week. I sent Perry a letter for uh, his review so that we can get that out to the municipality to know that next week when we do shut the filter down, for about a week to 10 days, we're gonna be only at running at about half a plant, half the capacity of the, of the facility. So uh, we'll ask people to, during the daytime, to conserve water a little bit, make sure they don't do, as uh, Wayne would say, any lawn watering in the <laughs> at this time of the year. So, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, so hopefully uh, people will get that message and not abuse the water between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Normal water usage is great, that's fine, but uh, try not to um, overdo it during the daytime next week. We had a spike there in filter two. I'm not sure what caused that, but uh, probably some usage. Um, but uh, do you remember what caused that spike in August, September there, Ashley? Not 100% sure. We did hydrant flushing in September, so that could have yeah. okay. had something to do with it, it. but uh, we would definitely have it documented in our logbook. Yep, yep, and yep. Chlorine is a um, very essential part of operations. Um, we, do have, we monitor chlorine residuals at the plant at the tower and at the uh, Dairy Queen booster station or Dairy Queen pumping station, not booster. Um, and there are rules, of course, for usage of chlorine, not too much, definitely not too little. Um, and you wanna make sure that uh, you have just the, the right feed rates. Uh, we did some changes back in 2018 and 2020 to help monitor and control chlorine better. Um, we made sure that we uh, monitored contact time. Contact time is very important in a, in a clear well at a water treatment plant. It's the amount of time it takes the, the chlorine is in the uh, clear well to do its job. And it takes time. So we need to make sure that the clear well is, ad clear well is adequately sized for one and also has the uh, amount of baffling in it. Now, the, the clear well here at... Bancroft does not have any baffling in it whatsoever. So it's basically when they do the scoring on the, co the contact time, we get the minimum amount of scoring for, uh, for Bancroft's clear well. Oh, question? Oh, okay. So you can see the averages there for chlorine residuals at the treatment plant, the water tower, pumping station, 
all good, all above requirements. Um, sometimes the Dairy Queen pump station gets a little low. Well, sometimes that's due to maintenance. Um, the tower always has a maximum of 4.99 every month. That's a unique design there that uh, when the uh, plant shuts down and is no longer feeding water to the tower, unfortunately, the chlorine still runs and we get a slug of chlorine in the piping. So it'll, it'll read 4.99. You know, we're trying to figure out how to repair, fix that, but we haven't done so yet. So we'll keep putting our heads together and try and figure that one out. So there's the treated chlorine residuals at the water plant. Pretty consistent from one part, first part of the year to the last. Tower. And the Dairy Queen, Dairy Queen pumping station. The unique thing about the Dairy Queen pumping station one is that that's our secondary uh, recording. The primary, of course, is the water treatment plant. The secondary is Dairy Queen. So it's basically reading the chlorine residual for the distribution system. So that's important um, for the ministry and for us. So we always have to make sure that that system is running perfectly. Next, yeah. uh, residual management. Um, of course, uh, just like a wastewater plant, water plant has residuals and uh, residues. Uh, chem most the water plant is mostly chemical residues. Uh, it's over ninety percent actually, and uh, so. But the uh, what happens is the material comes in in the raw water. It mixes with the uh, coag coagulant, and uh, the coagulant settles out the solids down in the bottom of the tank, and that uh, solids is wasted to the waste tank. Um, we do have a, uh, an effluent limit on the waste tank. So it's an average of 25 milligrams per liter on an annual average. So we can't exceed that average of 25. So we do, uh, we do monitor that. We also add coagulant to the waste tank to help settle out solids in the waste tank. And uh, once a year, we pull some sludge out of that waste tank and, and get rid of that. Wayne, I've got one question. In, in regards to the waste tanks, uh, have you got enough storage in them? Like, is there, is there sufficient storage? The waste tank at the water plant isn't very large, to my knowledge. Um, so, I mean, the uh, discharge is pretty much running 24-7 out of that tank. Mm -hmm. um, but the solids, the solids handling in that tank should could be better. Um, and but uh, yeah, Ashley could answer better than I can. But it's it's not a large waste tank, so we do have to pump it out quite uh, at least once a year. Yeah, yeah. Okay. There's, there's two tanks that run in series. So the first tank is the surge tank. So that will take a large amount of water at a time. And then once it gets to a certain level, a float tips, which causes a pump to turn on and pumps the sludge over to a settling tank. Okay, so we so with the, with the two tanks, we've got enough storage, you know, for for basically for the year until the spring. Yes. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Of course, that's all based on current volumes and current flows. Um, Wayne, I've, Wayne, I've got a question on this particular one that that table five January. It just yep. seemed like a strange figure. The seventy three. Yeah, it is. And uh, I, I do believe that that's a rookie mistake. We have a young operator who's learning how to, uh, how to sample and when to sample. Um, chances are he took a sample during a backwash. Uh, when, when, the, when you take a sample during a backwash, you get a whole bunch of stirred up material. Is it a wrong sample? Is it a wrong result? I don't know. I really don't know. But typically, if you look at the other numbers, the consistency with the other numbers is um, they're probably not taking during a back backwash. Okay. Um, the other that, that, that's only a speculation. I can't 
guarantee that that's how it was taken. Um, but uh, sometimes that happens. Sometimes you get a release or a slugger release of material. Um, and uh, and, and it, the numbers will be higher. The, the good thing about that is, is that it's an annual average. So the annual average is 10 and our limit is 25. So we are in compliance. But okay. you see that one time number and it kind of scares you. Um, but I've learned over the years just to be not be scared by one number, but it's the it's the yeah. annual average that has to okay. that. Okay. The other question I was going to ask you on the on the lake itself is whether uh, do we statistically determine that we need more chemical as the lake ages, or has there been a need, an indication that in fact uh, the lake needs more scrubbing and cleaning over the years, or can you tell that? Um, what, what typically happens is the lake will turn over a couple times a year. Um, in the spring runoff, it gets very cold, very, very mucky, um, and you get a lot of uh, higher nitrites, nitrates sort of in the, in the, in the winter, in the, in the spring and winter because of the covers of ice. Um, and it, it'll turn over. And then when, it, the, when the ice thaws, and the water warms up from the summer, you get a turnover in late summer. Um, and then if, the, if it gets really windy, you can always get a turnover at any time because of the wind. Um, and that's, but to say what the lake's getting older or um, what, Yeah, what I'm wondering degree, is whether in fact you, you require more chemicals because the lake is getting full of more impurities or whether that has yeah. changed over the years. We, 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 I don't think we've seen any of that. We do have to, we do have to change chemical feeds at certain times of the year. Okay, um, but otherwise- to compensate it's for the, okay. to compensate for the fact that the, the lake is stirred up. Yeah. So there's that uh, table just in the graph form. You can see the 73 spike at the beginning of the year and then the rest is good. Chemical consumption, do we track chemical consumption? Um, and, uh, I, I have a question on that one as well. And just out of curiosity, um, I noticed that we do it manually and that in fact there is electronic technology. Uh, and I suppose there's a little bit of a human error risk in terms of the actual chemical mix. But I'm just curious, is it a, is it an expensive and a preferable process to use electronic testing? It, it, it is. I mean, uh, transducers and level transducers and stuff are, are on the inexpensive side. They're probably a couple thousand dollars a piece. And, uh, and for a day tank, you don't really uh, put, uh, you can, but you don't really put tr level transducers in day tanks to, to, to measure chemicals. Um, we've been getting by with the system the way it is where we, uh, we take the uh, raw water calculation um, from 8 a.m. basically to 8 a.m. the following morning. And then we do our uh, chemical calcs based on that. And it's been working for years that way. And uh, we don't really see a problem with that. Okay. Um, but yeah, you can do it. You can do electronically, you can do it. If you, if you so desire to do that um, and measure tanks that way. Does, does the, is, is there a, a, a common practice? Is the common practice using humans to actually do the actual measurements? In small plants like this, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and in large facilities, no. I'm assuming in large plants where they use thousands and thousands of liters of chemical they probably have the transducer in a big storage tank and they just measure that transducer every day. Okay. Right? It automatically measures at midnight to midnight oh. and they, and it's automatically calculated for them. So yeah, but we don't, uh, we don't have that need yet. So, so we're just going to, uh, just a few little explanations here on the chemicals that we uh, use. Sodium hypochlorite, 12%, it's a liquid, um, some, it's liquid bleach. 
They don't really like to call it liquid chlorine. I know everybody else likes to call it liquid chlorine, but um, uh, the, the, the people that do training and stuff don't like to call it that. They just say it's, it's hyperchlorite, it's liquid bleach, that sort of thing. And that's added to the treated water going out into the mains, uh, out into the system. Um, and then of course we have the booster at the, at the standpipe. Uh, uh, chlorine booster at the standpipe. Sodium carbonate, soda ash, that's typically uh, used to adjust pH in the system. Uh, polyaluminum chloride, that's packle, that is our flocculant, that's what uh, settles uh, the materials that come in the raw water to the bottom of the, of the plant, of the uh, filters. Of course, here's chemical dosage rates, so I'm not going to dwell on that a lot, but uh, this shows you uh, the kind of feed rates that we have in the system. Again, we're just looking at the, the charts for the table that we just saw. <clears throat> pretty consistent volumes through the year. Now, there are ways of, of, make, of course, checking, uh, checking to make sure that you are feeding properly for seasonal uh, feed rates, and that's usually with a uh, magnetic jar stirrer, but we don't, we don't have that. That's a pricey little piece of equipment, but uh, maybe eventually we'll get a jar stirrer but, um, to check chemical feed rates, but uh, at this point in time, we don't have one, so. We just do it by feel. I'm going to let Ashley speak about this because she's the one who wrote this section. This so your maintenance this section, summary. Sorry? This is just the maintenance summary, so you can go ahead and speak on that. Yes, yeah, so there are some routine maintenance that we do mostly on a monthly basis, and that would be uh, draining and cleaning the filters, that's just to get rid of excess sludge that's settled in the bottom of the settling tank. Um, checking our chemical pumps, making sure they're pumping properly, the fittings are tight, um, there's nothing building up in the lines, air, anything like that. Um, uh, we have to, for compliance reasons, clean our turbidity and our chlorine analyzers monthly. Um, we also calibrate them at the same time. And uh, we run our generator, our backup power, uh, just to be sure that we're not going to have any issues if we do have a, a power outage. Um, then we have regulated sampling that we're required to do. So there's annual sample sampling that we normally do in the beginning of January. Um, so it's expensive. There's a lot of bottles. They test for um, organics and inorganics. Um, then we have our quarterly sampling. So that's done January, April, all through. Um, for THMs, HAAs, which are trihalomethanes, uh, haloacetic acids, and then nitrites and nitrates. So those are things that can build up from chemicals sitting in the system. Um, then we have our lead sampling. Bancroft uh, has been doing reduced lead sampling because there's a very low concentration of lead in the system in the past. Um, so then we have microcystin sampling, which is fairly new. Um, and that is for algal blooms. So we test for that on the raw and treated water between June and October. Um, and that's something that's regulated by the ministry. Uh, we have our weekly biological sampling, which is done every week throughout the town. Uh, then we do our annual flow meter calibrations, things like that, that just have to be checked annually to make sure that we're regulating that stuff properly. Go down a little bit. This is just some distribution maintenance that we've done um, to keep things up to par, different hydrants that we've noticed have deficiencies. Um, we and some water main breaks that we 
repaired in 2021. Uh, we replaced the inline booster pumping station, the two pumps there back in September, I believe it was. Yeah, close enough. Yep. Um, so that's all up to par and working properly. Um, and we installed three new auto flushing devices on the end of Monk Street, Valley View Drive, and Bancroft Ridge Drive. And that's just, they're in place to keep water flowing in those dead ends so we don't have stagnant water losing chlorine residual. Yeehaw! Can we put one at the end of Sherburn Street South, please, Ashley? <laughs> you have to ask Perry for that one. Uh, can we please have one at the end of Sherburn Street South, please, Perry? Perry's going to have to go to council now for that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, but all right. Another time. <laughs> so the next part is his monthly, uh, monthly maintenance, non-routine maintenance stuff that, uh, that happens throughout the year. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, um, I paused there for a minute. Um, so the, yeah, this is just broken down into each month, some significant maintenance we did that was out of the normal. Um, we got a brand new roof on the water treatment plant in 2021, which was a long awaited project that needed to be done a long time ago. <laughs> so that's really good. Um, the building holds heat better. There's no water on the floor. No water that's dripping on the upgrade. electrical. Yes. <laughs> yes, so Beacon Construction did a very good job on that. Um, we had a water main break in the month of January. Um, just a couple of random things in February, water main breaks which it's that time of year. Um, we replaced the UPS and Dairy Queen that runs our chlorine analyzer if there's ever a power outage. Um, so March, there was some flow testing done. Uh, I believe that was for some developers that are doing some work down in that area. Uh, the new roof was finished in March. Um, did some odd jobs, replaced a pressure switch on the generator, or sorry, the air compressor, which is used to run our backwashes. Um, let's see, transfer switch on the generator, that was a big one as well. Um, that went on us, and uh, that's used for automatic transfer if the power goes out and we need to run the plant on backup power. We had a, I don't know if it was in, I think it was in March that uh, we noticed someone had broken into the compound in the water plant where the generator is. So um, they did some fencing to make it up higher to keep people out of that area when no one's around. We did our spring hydrant flushing program in May. New garage door, did quite a few upgrades to the water plant in 2021. Um, nothing too significant. September, we did our high, uh, fall hydrant flushing program. Our new auto flushers were installed to buy Mac and Roy mains. Um, okay, so it was October that our, our Bridge Street West booster pumps were replaced. That was a big job, but we got it done. Brings us to almost the end of the year. Uh, we got our waste tank cleaned out and all the sludge removed. And December was a big one as well. Uh, new chlorine system in the plant. So we moved it from the, the old original building out behind the water plant. Um, we've moved it inside the main building. Um, brand new pumps, new day tank, um, new chemical containment all that good stuff, so we're in good shape. So the next part is expenditure summary for the year and uh, some projects looking forward and uh, 
And of course, everybody everybody has a wish list. So uh, we'll look at that. The blue was the actual projects that were completed in uh, 2021. Uh, so we have the uh, Bridge Street West booster station. We, we, what we did there were pumps and piping and some valves. Um, and uh, that was a big job, as Ashley said, but uh, well worth it. I haven't heard of any complaints since that project was done. Have you, Ashley? Not at all. Uh, well, that's a good thing. Uh, new auto flushers were installed. That's actually a good price. The uh, budget price was 75,000. So that's actually pretty good. 53,000. <clears> Keep on going down the red. The red uh, in the next column is 2022. That's the, uh, those are projects that are already planned for 2022. Um, so, so the hypo feed system to switch that out was $30,000. So that's transfer switch. Uh, raw turbidity analyzer, uh, the roof replacement, 106,000, and the garage door. Uh, the roof replacement and the transfer switch were both emergency jobs, so they weren't originally budgeted for, but uh, they had to be done. Question? Yes. Uh, the uh, roof replacement, those maintenance type of uh, charges, are they paid for by the through the water or through the town budget on buildings? I'm assuming that was paid for by the water and sewer rates, I would assume. Yes, yes, Councillor Wiggins, that's paid for the capital portion out of the water or wastewater budgets. Thank you. And uh, so we got a, another inspection coming up in 2022. And the next page. We're going to be doing some, as I said, uh, filter media replacement on train one. Uh, got $59,000 there to do that. Got the electrical heaters in that, uh, in the main building. They've all pretty much failed. We got one, I think, out of four working, Ashley. Yes. And uh, Tyler's working on uh, getting those fixed up for us, Tyler Lawrence. And uh, you can see the, the six paddle jar stir there. I was talking about that for. Um, we're doing tests, uh, seasonally tests, or whenever you need to do tests. Uh, that little symbol beside the six paddle jarster is the Veolia logo, which means Veolia gets it at a discounted price. The actual price, if you were to go out and buy it, would be twice that price. So Veolia gets it for about 50% off. And we, we, we let you have the savings on that. That's true. <laughs> A lot, of, a lot of stuff that we do do um, when we get to the wastewater side um, and the lab, lab work and stuff is uh, all at a discounted price because uh, we're sharing that with you. So we're not really sharing. We're giving you the, the reductions. So well, We appreciate that. Yeah. I know you do. I know you do. Perry does. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so if I could make a comment. Uh, uh, Dwayne, on the uh, before you go into item number six here. Yep. Um, I want to go back up. There is, there's a long list uh, that people can see uh, for our capital works, and um, a lot of it's in black, but um, the money that we're spending is in red. Um, Dwayne gives us, uh, as he calls it, his wish list. It's not really a wish list. It's the work that needs to be completed on an annual basis in our capital budgets. Then we go through and we pick the, the high efficient, uh, um, the most uh, categorizing ones from item number one uh, for the highest priority down. And we work within the uh, budget that we have set annually and that is through the, um, uh, the Watson report that we have uh, used re uh, uh, previously. It's not saying that all of this work isn't getting completed. Um, Dwayne does uh, an amazing job with uh, Ashley and Brandon to prioritize what needs to be done. And then we can budget further with the, uh, with the capital work that has been set aside to get done. Um, for example, with the roof replacement and, and things like that, um, 
Dwayne and Ashley and uh, Brandon work with us very well to um, kind of rob from Peter to pay Paul within that uh, capital works year to make sure that we get everything completed. But uh, he's very diligent on having the uh, high priority stuff completed uh, in the order that needs to be done. Thank you. So, uh, regulatory compliance summaries, they're included in the, uh, in the annual report under uh, the extras, um, adverse water quality incidents. If we had any, those reports would be in there, but there were no adverse water quality incidences in uh, 2021. So that's a, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. water, none of the water main breaks caused uh, any issues with regards to that. So uh, they were all controlled and uh, we had no loss of water, which would, which would cause an AWQI. Just a question here. The, the uh, non-compliance report is a, a provincial inspection? Uh, the, the provincial inspection is also included in those appendages, appendages or whatever you want to call them, appendices, supporting documents. Those reports are there. The non-compliance, if there was any non-compliance, they would be in that report. Um, and uh, we would have included them on that in that section six. But there wasn't, there wasn't any non-compliances in 2021. Hmm. We, behave, we behave ourselves. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Millett. Um, just as a, a request for the future, and I'm sure I've seen this every year, so I don't know why I don't have this in my head, but um, uh, is, is there a way for us to have a total at the end of this? So how did our capital expenditures compared to what we were actually budgeted within our uh, a plan for the water and waste system? Uh, you don't have to answer that question right now. Just well, I, can, I, can, I can do that for you right now. On the, oh, water, side, awesome. on the water side, because of the roof, we were $84,000 over. Okay. Okay. Now, if we didn't have the roof, we would have been under. Well, I put it this, put it this way: I wouldn't have been under because I always spend the money. <laughs> Fair enough. I, I, I always find something just else to spend it on if it's available. Because there's set. You saw that list. There's a lot of stuff on that list that we could fill the gap with, right? You know, even if it's even if it was like that jar stir, for instance, if I had five thousand left, I would I would have bought the jar stir, get it off the list, right? Um, so that's 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 how I that's how I do things. When you see the wastewater one next month, you'll go. That's huge. The wastewater one is huge. And uh, so that's, well, that's that's not. I'm not looking forward to that. Thank you for the heads up. Um, <laughs> you're you're not going to skip that meeting, are you? Uh, no, I don't plan to. <laughs> And if, if there could just be sort of that little thing added in there, Dwayne, that would really be appreciated. Just at some point, you know, sure, for, we could do that. We could you do know, that. just a simple line. Here's here. It's great that it's here. I love it. Thank you very much. And I really appreciate the information. It makes me feel safe. It makes me feel like my water is looked after and it should make our uh, community feel that way. So and, you know, no incidents is a very good thing to report. So maybe just one line, out, especially after this this number piece, you know, here is what yep. we spent. Here's what was budgeted some reasoning why and is as simple as that and understanding the 2022 budget is you've got your asks on there that's awesome but i mean we will be obviously that will be part of what we uh plan for the year but uh just a simple comparison would be really awesome i think for us yep, thank you that. That. thank you uh, now that you've given me that heads up i'll make sure it gets in the wastewater good anyone else have any questions for Dwayne or Ashley? i have a i have a question uh, deputy mayor yep yeah, there yeah um i guess so at what percentage is the, uh, the treating plant operating and like how much more growth uh, to the town will it withstand before we have to really look at some bigger upgrades or, or do we have to? Uh, well, if you want me to give you the short answer, short version. you should be planning now to replace the facility. Yeah. Okay. It's for all the growth that you want to do, it's not big enough. Okay. That's what I was uh, curious. In the immediate, <laughs> the small subdivisions, yeah, you you got a lot. But if you're going to do fire control, you're not big enough now for that, and you're not going to be big enough in the future for sure. If you want fire control, 
but that's a 10 year outlook too right that's not like something that we need to do in the next five years this is uh, but this is know, the, the planning is what you need to start with get get a yeah. consultant um and start pl doing the planning it's similar I councillor mcgillan to what we're doing right now with our um, um with our re-rating at the uh, wastewater plant you know where we're into that process right now. We're doing the uh, the RFP right out there now for the sustainability of the water and the wastewater out in the north end uh, with the feasibility study that we're doing. So it, it, it is something that uh, Duane and myself uh, and Andra are are on top of. Um, unfortunately, this, this is something that uh, will be affecting our capital budget over and above what we're doing right now on an annual basis and we need to be prepared and plan for that in the future uh, you know 10 15 years out yeah and i guess and, and that's my concern is that we don't put the blinders on pretend it's not a problem i i just w would hope that we're we're starting to build some reserves and uh, and that i know we're we're getting to a better spot with our wastewater but uh yeah i, I just don't want us all of a sudden to uh have a huge burden on our uh, user base you got you got a forty year old plant, uh, councillor. Yep. Given so, you can just you just factor that in, right? Yeah. You got a forty year old plant with, with a lot of very aggressive plans to expand the municipality, which are great, but you have to expand the uh, infrastructure to go with it. Yeah, I'm a fifty two year old uh, person, and I'm a, a, in peak my peak uh, performance here now. So. <laughs> if, if that's any indication right no well, 40 years plus 10 right Big, yeah uh, the there you go so. 10 to 15 so we're in the right ballpark well, I'm, yeah. I'm 54 i'm going downhill so that peak isn't very big right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think i've uh, I, i've gone over the peak so <laughs> thanks barry so uh, amber's amber got one more slide to show you oh okay did you ever there it is Okay, so this slide is the slide for the multi-barrier approach to providing safe drinking water. Um, as you read through my, uh, through my report, you'll see that I've mentioned the multi-barrier approach quite a few times. And the multi-barrier approach is, if you look at the center, if you want safe drinking water, do you not? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so the yes, multi-barrier sure. multi approach came out of the Walkerton, um, the Walkerton report. And is basically saying, if you only have one barrier, chances are people are gonna get sick. If you have two barriers, it's better than having one. If you have three, it's better than having two. Chances of all the barriers failing to make people sick is very low, unless of course you have another water. So source water protection, that's where it starts. So Lake Clark Lake is our source water. We have to make sure that Motorized vehicles are not getting on that lake under any circumstances, whether summer boats or whether it's winter skidoos or, or four, four wheelers, they got to be off that lake. If one of them fell through and contaminated that water, it could be years before you could use that water again. Because the oil and the, and the fuel get in there, especially if it's diesel fuel, it could be years before you could use that water again. And the cost of cleanup would be huge. So source water protection, that's where it starts. Effective treatment, that's also the next barrier to a uh, multi-barrier approach. Making sure the treatment plant is at its uh, maximum ability to treat the water. We're, we're, we're uh, doing filter media change out on, on train one. We did train two in 2019 which means the performance of the facility will improve after the changeup. So that's good. That's what we want. We want to do those things within the treatment plant to improve the overall process efficiency and what we're going to get out of it. Secure distribution system. We have to make sure that our distribution system is secure from uh, vandals, secure from accidental poisoning, secure from uh, purposeful poisoning, all of that stuff. We have to make sure it's secure, uh, not only from that standpoint, but make sure that we do our job to make sure the booster stations are working fine, to make sure uh, we get on a water main break as soon as we can, that sort of thing. And 
um, plan out getting rid of the steel piping in the ground. We have to continue to do that. That's securing the distribution system. That's adding a multi-barrier approach. Uh, of course, effective monitoring. We have good monitoring. Perry's making sure that uh, when I ask for something with that regard, he's allowing us to get it. And uh, we, we have good effective monitoring. Could it always be better? Sure, it could always be better. But we're working on that. We're trying to make things better all the time. Hence the tower. We want to make sure that that tower, we can figure out how to get that tower chlorine residual into a proper, a proper uh, number, not have 4.99. That's, that's, uh, that's a silly number. And, but I can smell the chlorine on Sunday mornings when I turn on my tap. That, the, that chlorine's been sitting in there. And effective management, that's one of the biggest ones. Effective management, making sure that we have the resources we need, the finances we need. Um, as a project manager, I'm making sure my staff have the training they need and the resources they need for all of that stuff and that the systems are maintained. We have to make sure that equipment's maintained, the systems are maintained. That's how we get the multi-barrier approach to safe drinking water. And uh, are, are we 100% there? I would say no, but we're working towards it. We do have multi-barriers within our system, so we have safe drinking water. And that's what we've seen today as we reported today, we have safe drinking water. So I just thought, well, I'd, I just thought I'd show that to you. Well, I'm glad you did, Dwayne. That's, uh, I mean, we all want safe drinking water for everyone. And uh, it's nice to be brought up to date on what's happening and what was meant. But not only what was spent, but how how we how how the staff keep keep us with safe drinking water. So appreciate that. Okay. Uh, if there's no yep. further questions for Dwayne or Ashley, I'll, uh, I'll we we already have the first uh, motion resolution moved and seconded. So uh, that is to receive this report. Uh, all those in favor of that? Okay, thanks, Carrie. And I'll read the second one. Be it resolved that the Committee of the Whole does hereby recommend that Council of the Corporation Center of Bancroft approve the 2021 annual report for the Bancroft Water Treatment Plant as presented. A mover and a seconder. Moved by Val, seconded by Tracy. All those in favor? Carried. Well, there you go, Duane. Thank you very much for your report and uh, announced as well. All right. Keep up the good care, work everybody. and uh, we, we, can, we, we can certainly report that we have safe drinking water. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Moving on to, let me see here. Administrative Money Monetary Penalty System, AMPS, byline introduction. And I'm, I'm assuming that Andre is going to speak on that. Thank you, Andre. Yep, so thank you members of council, uh, deputy mayor, and those who may be watching at home. Uh, today, I just wanna provide you with a quick overview of the administer administrative monetary penalty system. Um, why I think we should consider moving forward with um, putting one of those in place in the town of Bancroft and have some discussion about what it is, answer some of your questions. Um, as well as get an idea from you if we want to proceed further uh, in that direction. So I did previously circulate the AMPS uh, draft bylaw to all of you um, because it is quite a long document and I wanted you to have an opportunity to look at it. I'm not gonna read it to you today because that's like 20 pages that you don't need me to read to you. Um, but I know I've received some questions from some of you, and I'm happy to answer any questions that any of you have after your first look at it. Okay. Are you ready to take questions now, Andrew? Sure. I mean, unless there's a particular part of it that you want me to go over, I guess I can do a, a high-level overview of what it is first, and then um, we can answer okay. more specific questions. So the Municipal Act, uh, when it was amended, um, provided municipalities with the ability to um, incorporate and administer an AMPS bylaw. An AMPS bylaw is intended to replace the traditional provincial offenses court system of issuing tickets and fines for contraventions. 
uh, and giving the authority of municipalities to manage that ticketing process for things that are unique to their municipality. Um, the exception to that is with a parking bylaw, if we had one, um, we could use the Provincial Offenses Act as it's outlined, or the Highway Traffic Act and the offenses listed in there with the approved fines um, to issue tickets here uh, in, in regard to that app, uh, that um, piece of legislation. So an example of that would be someone parking in a accessible parking space. As long as we had it properly signed with all the proper notices required under the Highway Traffic Act, and we could document the time the vehicle was there, that it didn't have a permit, all that kind of stuff, the AMPS bylaw would allow us to issue a parking infraction ticket for someone parking in one of those spots, instead of relying on the police to come and do that as a provincial offenses or highway traffic act charge. Um, so it, it can be used for parking related things like that. We can issue our own speeding tickets, uh, doesn't count for that, uh, but uh, municipal specific impact things <clears throat> like parking in accessible spots, parking in a snow route, so if we have a no a snow route sign posted, no parking here between May and September or no overnight parking and someone parks there and it impedes the plow, that's a provincial or a municipally designed law and we could use the AMPS bylaw to issue a penalty or a ticket for that if we had a parking bylaw to support it. More generally speaking, this is for general bylaws, things like noise bylaws, animal control bylaws, fireworks and burning bylaws. So things that each municipality puts in place on its own to reflect the unique needs of that municipality. Uh, the bylaws can be written in any format that you want them to be, but they have to contain the appropriate language for the AMPS bylaw in order for them to be, um, be able to be used in that system. Because it replaces an actual court process system, it does require a lot of front end loading and setup. We would have to assign a staff person or two to be the screening officer. So if I gave Val a ticket for parking in a handicapped parking spot, as the, um, the road super could do, um, then the screening officer, if she disagreed with that ticket, she would ask the screening officer to review it. There would be a meeting where she could provide evidence that, hey, it wasn't my car. My car was parked at Tim Hortons. Here's a picture of it in the parking lot. You got the license plate wrong. She could provide evidence to refute the ticket or provide an explanation for why she was parked in that spot that maybe the screener would accept or not. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. Maybe she has a parking permit and just forgot it at home that day, but brings it with her to show it would have been in effect if she hadn't just forgot to put it in her window those kind of things. So you'd have to, to appoint a screening officer that can be a staff person, but it can't be a staff person who has the ability to issue a notice under any of our bylaws. So it can't be our fire chief or he can't issue a ticket for someone lighting a fire in a no burn zone. It can't be our roads uh, manager because then his staff can't, he can't and his staff can't issue tickets for parking in a no snow zone. Um, it can't be our building or bylaw official because they can issue tickets all the time for a myriad of things related to our bylaws. So it would have to be someone else who wouldn't be in an enforcement position. Once that screening process was completed, if Val still disagreed with my ticket, then she has the right to request it, an actual hearing. We would also appoint a hearing officer that person cannot be an employee of the town of Bancroft and needs to be impartial. Many municipalities, well, it's about a 50-50 split. Half of them use their legal counsel that they've already retained to have this 15 or 20 minute conversation to decide if the ticket should stand. And about half of them hire a local paralegal uh, to do those reviews. So we would have to retain someone and just kind of have them on standby in the event that we weren't able to resolve the outstanding issue at screening and a member who received a notice wanted to take that review further. That's pretty much the setup up front other than the actual bylaws. Any bylaws we want to have uh, administered under the AMPS policy need to be updated to reflect all of those things. So you have to make reference to what will be in the ticket, who 
that there's a screening process, that there's a hearing review available. And you have to notify folks about that when you issue a notice or an infraction. Um, all of those things have to be pre-formatted, I guess. So we would come up with a ticket or a notice template that we would use to advise people that um, we were placing a penalty against them. Penalties are considered to be debts to the municipality. So if you fail to pay your ticket within the required time period, those debts can be added to your tax roll. Um, they can also be sent to formal collections. In the case of enforcing a parking bylaw, should we ever choose to do that, they can also be registered under contract with the Ministry of Transportation against the license plate that was uh, part of the infraction. That would result in someone not being able to renew their license until the fine was paid. That is also a very administrative heavy process in that we have to provide monthly reports to the MTO about each and every ticket that we've issued every month until the ticket is resolved. So if someone didn't pay their fine for a year, we would have to report every month for 12 months that that ticket was still outstanding and hadn't been paid by the municipality to the MTO. Um, what else can I tell you about AMPS? Many, many municipalities are using this. Locally, about half of our immediate neighbors are using an AMPS policy. Others are considering it. Um, it, it does make sense when we're trying to get compliance with things that aren't really considered to be priorities in provincial offenses court. Things like property standards or noise complaints, those can take months or even years to work through a provincial offenses court system process. This allows us to resolve those within 30 or 60 days um, to the completion of a hearing if things were to get to that point. Wayne, you got a question and so is Bear. Okay, well, I just wanted to say that uh, through the uh, Building and Bylaw Committee working on this with, with staff uh, for quite a while, uh, I personally uh, like the idea. The thing that, that we're stressing here that to our uh, constituents, this isn't a money-making proposition. No. This is a break-even proposition, but it's a compliance issue. And we have a lot of bylaws that have to be uh, rewritten and brought up to standards, but I personally would like to see the staff move ahead with this uh, program. I think it's a great one, um, and uh, we uh, see where it goes. But I, I definitely would like to brought ahead uh, for sure, for my opinion. So, with regard to that, it's very clearly stated in the municipal act that this is not intended to be a money making venture for the municipality. That it's just intended to recover the costs of attempting to gain compliance with the bylaws that exist. Mm -hmm. one, other Bear, you one, other, one other comment, if I could, and then I'll get out of here, is uh, uh, I believe we might have trouble uh, attaching it to license renewal from the announcement made today that uh, they're not going to, I'm not sure how it's going to work, but they're not going to have license renewal going forward. So uh, at least on the sticker about your driver's license. But anyway, that's another thing you can work towards. Yep. So Mary, you had a question? Yeah, I guess I have my reservations. Um, I, I see the benefits, but there again, if you have to go through these extra steps, uh, 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 you know, and appoint people, uh, have hearings, do we add extra cost to that to, to cover our costs? Like is a $50 ticket going to pay for the $300 that it's going to cost to have the hearing and, and, and that part of it? I, and I guess the other thing is, uh, to me, it's, it's some of it, I feel it's the province shirking their responsibility. It's a bit of that download again, in a sense. And uh, I, I don't know, I, I just don't feel right that we're the judge, jury and executioner in, in that same sense, you know, and uh, we're, we're the municipal council here and uh, the municipality. And, and uh, I just think, our tier of government's getting too powerful or, or, or being enabled to, to have too much power. So uh, I just, those are my concerns. Okay. So I, I can speak to the hearing fees. So that is built in here. There is a hearing fee associated, associated with anyone who wants to challenge their ticket beyond the screening portion. And we would set what that is as a cost recovery cost. 
So it varies from between 50 and $250 per hearing, um, depending on the municipality that you're looking at and how they've contracted that service. Okay, Val, you had a question. Yeah, thank you, Deputy Mayor. So, uh, you know, in tandem with my colleagues, I, I first of all, I think uh, Mr. Wiggins, you're absolutely right. This is this isn't a punitive position. This is understanding that some of our constituents have frustrating moments where they can't deal with uh, a property standard with a neighbor or a barking dog or uh, noise or uh, you know people parking where they shouldn't. A variety of things that are you know sort of really really frustrating to our community, but at times really difficult to deal with. On the other side, I, I, I see uh, where, where Barry is coming from. All I keep saying in, in my head is spending $1,500 to collect 50. And, it, you know, and if this rolls out to a, a lawyer and you know, a lawyer for three hours, is, it's, it, we're gonna spend thousands of dollars to chase nothing, it almost seems like. And it will feel punitive, no matter what we want to sort of say to our community, that's not what it's about, but that's what it's going to feel like. So I'm really on the fence. I, I really am struggling to, and I, my next comment is we're gonna go through all this work, which has been a ton of work. So thank you very much uh, to staff and Andra for, put it, for bringing this proposal forward. And we still have a bit more to go. It's still gonna need to be vetted. A lawyer is still gonna have to review it all. And we're gonna put it on the table. And if we don't do anything with it, it doesn't look good. So it it really if if we if we decide this is something that we really want in our municipality we need to make sure we enforce it and we need to have really really clear guidelines on how we're going to enforce it my last question is are we able to um run this as a project uh, a pilot project could we maybe bring this to the table for a year and see what happens and if it doesn't work we're able to say trash amps i mean maybe we're able to say that anyways but are uh, is it worth presenting it to our community as a, a pilot project something that might be helpful to somebody who's struggling with some simple bylaw things going on in our community um or does it become something that is so egregious for us to manage it's just not worth doing uh is is it a right approach to try it as a pilot project Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Mayor. You're welcome. I'd like just to no. like say something and then I'll yeah. take the other question, John. Uh, the one question I had under was, if we were to pass this, does it have to be uh, okayed by some ministry or, or because of the municipal, municipal act has changed, we can automatically do it? That, that's my first question. Yep, so the municipal act gives us the authority to enact and, and commence with an AMPS bylaw. We don't need anyone's yep. permission to do that. Okay, and my second question is, or comment, I guess, is I don't, I, I've spoken to, I've had questions with different former bylaw folks, and I think all of them have said our bylaws, they're very, very difficult to enforce because we don't have this particular program to enforce it. Is, is that correct? It is. None of our bylaws, with the exception of our burn bylaw, I believe, actually contain the legislative references and language required for provincial offenses to be able to um, enforce them. So mm -hmm. as it stands right now, we, we don't really have any standing with too many of our bylaws. We have other mechanisms um, through the building code. We can issue property standards and fractions as well and collect, connect or collect or enforce um, that way for compliance. Um, the burn bylaw is also covered under emergency response acts. So we can still um, issue fines and do cost recovery for someone who sets a campfire that gets away from them um, after they've been warned five times that they can't have a campfire because it's no burning right now. So there are other mechanisms for some of our bylaws to make them enforceable. Um, but some of them are so archaic and old that they don't contain any of the language that would allow provincial offenses court to uphold a notice if we issued one. Most of our bylaws don't even have a fine schedule. So mm -hmm. we can tell you that you're in, you know, contravention of the bylaw, but there's no penalty associated with that. So uh, as I read this, um, the stamps, <laughs> we don't have a schedule for, for penalties yet. I, am I correct in that? So Let me have to put that together. Yeah. That's right. So, for example, if we were to do a new, uh, if we wanted to have control of a noise bylaw under AMPS, 
we would have to re rewrite our noise bylaw to include the AMPS language and provisions mm -hmm. and create a short list or short wording statement of what the contraventions are, uh, as well as a, a schedule of what the fines are for those contraventions. Those have to be published in advance and be part of the actual bylaw. And then mm -hmm. they form part of AMPS. Okay. John, you had a question? Yes, uh, just a couple of comments, Charles. Uh, first of all, I agree with you that I think the, in general, the, the community tends to look on uh, enforcement in the town very lightly, and uh, they don't always take them seriously because, in fact, there hasn't been the teeth to be able to do anything uh, when they have these violations take place. Uh, I also think that, in general, um, you're looking at uh, amending the bylaws uh, the bylaws have to be very carefully rewritten. They don't have, it's a small community. We could roll in the specific bylaws that we've carefully worded to do that. And finally, I don't think a lot of it's going to end up in the screening position. I think the, the goal is to try and persuade the community and visitors to actually comply with the regulations that we have. I think it's worth rolling out, but we don't have to take the whole sweep of bylaws initially, we could work our way through it to a point where, in fact, it's it's feasible to implement them, make sure that, in fact, we're not burying ourselves with bureaucracy, and then perhaps add to it. That's the comment I have. Okay. Thank you, John. That's, I, I, you know, I, I, I've complained last year about noise bylaws and dogs and and uh, speaking with, with uh, different people and, as I mentioned, different uh, bylaw folks. The, you know, we we think we have a bylaw, but it really isn't enforceable. So, I, personally, I, I I agree with with some of the comments that that uh, Barry has mentioned. You know, it's it's a download from the province, uh, but it is what it is, and uh, we're we're left with it. So, uh, I, I'm certainly in favor of it. I, I think you've got a very good uh, point, John, of going through the bylaws, you know, systematically and changing them to work with the amps. When 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 we need them changed, so I'm uh, the 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 motion the resolution you've got here, Andra, is to uh, for discussion purposes. We've been discussing it. Is there anything else? Yeah, was your intent to pass it forward to council or? Uh, no, today was really to find out if you want me to continue building the forms. There are several codes of conduct that have to go along with this. For example, there's a requirement that the uh, town have a conflict of interest policy um, so that, you know, because my child got a ticket, I can't be the screening officer and waive his fee. Uh, you know, they're, they're, all of those things are built in as safety systems. Mm -hmm. There are six different um, actual uh, code things that you have to have, like policies that relate to this and how it's administered inside the municipality. Um, the comment about the bylaws, you're absolutely right. To enact an AMPS bylaw, we only need one. Um, so AMPS can become active when we have one bylaw attached to it. So we could start very small with, say, an animal control bylaw. That's all we want to include in our AMPS right now as for enforcement purposes and see how far that takes us or how many complaints we have, how many of them proceed to screening or hearing. And then very similar to a comprehensive zoning bylaw, you amend your AMPS bylaw to add your other bylaws and structures over time as you amend them. But you only have to have one to start mm -hmm. it, and you can choose what that one is. I do have a list of the top five complaints that come through um, the town. And I would suggest that we choose one of those if we want to move forward to see what it would look like um, so that we're actually addressing things that people are calling about um, so that we have something to measure against because uh, putting in a bylaw for something nobody ever calls to complain about isn't really going to give you mm -hmm. a measure of whether or not AMPS would be successful. Yep. Okay. And so obviously you would have more, uh, you, you would have more work on this for a while. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Tracy, did you have a question? I did. Yeah. I just was curious as you know, with, with implementing this, what kind of an impact will this have on our staff, do you think, time-wise? Like, is it going to cut into what they're doing? Do we have to hire somebody else to look after this? Or what do you foresee happening there? 
or can we go and uh, adapt some of these uh, other municipalities bylaws? We absolutely can. Uh, absolutely. Um, bylaws are borrowed from other municipalities all the time uh, and, and added in. I would be lying to you if I told you that I drafted this from scratch. <laughs> it's actually a compilation of four different municipalities. Um, two large scale ones and two smaller scale ones. And I've taken the pieces from each that would, I think would work for us here. Um, that's normal practice. I wouldn't be writing the six policies that have to go with it from scratch. I would be borrowing them and amending them to reflect our unique needs. Um, I, I guess the, the measure of the staff impact would be hard to tell for sure until we actually implemented this. Um, right now, our bylaw enforcement officer goes back to the same place week after week after week for months at a time trying to get compliance on an issue. And other than going back and saying, you didn't do it last week, can you please do it this week? He really doesn't have any, um, anything to, to force forward motion if someone chooses not to comply. So in that sense, I think it could save some time. You know, if we had a policy here that was you get three warnings and then you're getting a ticket you know, kind of a thing. Um, it could save some staff time there. As you mentioned earlier, I don't foresee a big in, uh, request in a number of, uh, the number of cases that go to screening and even fewer to hearing because it is based on cost recovery. So there is a fee if you want a screening appointment and there's an additional fee if you want a hearing appointment. And if you're not successful at your screening appointment because you just wanted to do it so you didn't have to pay the fine, there's also a late payment fee in addition to the initial infraction and the fee for asking for a screening hearing that you were unsuccessful in. So, so there are things built into it so it, it doesn't become frivolous, I guess. Um, <clears throat> probably takes a couple hours to prepare for a screening hearing and actually have it and then issue the decision letter. How many times that would happen, it, it's really hard to tell. And that would be, um, you know, partly how many bylaws we actually include uh, this wording for and, and use the system. Okay, Wayne, you had a question. Yeah, hey, I just want to make a comment if I could, Charles. This, this is just another tool in the toolbox for our for our staff to, to try to keep our town uh, the way our residents want it. I don't visualize this being used, hopefully very, very little, uh, but it does give our staff a, a little bit that they can uh, use as, as a deterrent to some of the individuals or some of the situations that happen. And I think we've all had calls from uh, different residents about different situations. And yes, it's it me. It, might be more uh, down to the individual at the time, but they still are residents and we have to look after them too. And if they have a complaint, uh, as you say, a barking dog or a, uh, a car that parks sideways on the side, whatever it might be, uh, if we can add those uh, to them and say like, you know, you gotta comply buddy or, or else this is, this is an option I can use. And I think 90% of the people will comply at that. But right now it's just, I, I feel sorry for our bylaw officer going out talking to these individuals and they're more or less, a lot of them are just thumbing themselves at them, so. Well, I know what you mean, yeah. And uh, and uh, at, at the present time, I think the ones that are really are an issue, we, uh, we don't have anything to really force them at the present time until you end up going to court. So uh, to me, this is a, a certain would be a help to, to the, uh, to, to getting our, 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 our rules and regulations um, I tend to do and, and, and agree with and work with. So, uh, and I'll ask you the question, uh, this is for discussing purposes. Are you looking for something to say to move, to move it forward? Um, I don't need anything official. I really just, if, if the consensus today was, yeah, we're not doing this here, then I, I won't put any more effort into it. But if there's a general, well, let's explore it some more and see where it can go, then I'll continue to to build the package. Um, I, I would suggest and recommend that we have uh, a meeting dedicated solely to this once everything is in place, once the forms are designed for requesting a screening hearing or you know, once we have all the policies in place to support it, once the bylaw looks the way it does, and once we have another bylaw to complement it so that we can see how they work together. 
um, that we have a meeting specifically for that, uh, a public meeting to, to discuss it in more detail and more openly. Good, okay, thanks. Uh, Barry? Yeah, I, I, I support going forward on it. I, I guess I'm some, somewhat skeptical, but I agree with John, we gotta keep the bureaucracy out of it, keep it simple. And I'm certain there are, are <coughs> other municipalities we can take reference from as to what works best and doesn't. So uh, I support going ahead with it, but I, as, I have as, would I, as would I. Okay. So it looks, uh, looks to as we, if we've got consensus to, to can you continue moving forward with it. To, uh, I will do that then. Um, I think Perry had a comment as well. Oh, Perry, sorry. Uh, thank you. Um, just a question. Um, we run into multiple situations with the Highway Traffic Act as far as uh, plowing snow across a municipal road, uh, vehicles impeding on snow plow operations. Uh, Andre, would this, uh, would this uh, supersede the Highway Traffic Act uh, through a municipal bylaw that we could enforce this? We do now um, mark the vehicles and if the vehicles are there, then we do have them towed at the owner's expense, but uh, I, for myself, would like to have something that would have a little bit more of a uh, um, teeth behind it or a, a written document like this to support what we do. Yeah, so the AMPS would allow us to do that for certain parts of the Highway Traffic Act, like parking in a no parking zone, like impeding a snow plow, like pushing snow out on a road not things like impaired driving or speeding or running a red light. That's a different part of the Highway Traffic Act, but the safety parts of it, it would allow us to do. Um, failing to put money in a parking meter is covered under it. All of those kind of not dangerous, not potentially criminal offenses, but things that make doing our daily work um, more difficult. That's really kind of a way to think about it. That would require us to, to have a municipal parking um, policy, which would have to be part of AMPS and then would require that reporting every month to MTO. So that piece of it would be a little bit more administrative heavy if we chose to do that, but the capability is there to do that. Okay. Uh, I'll read this last resolution, uh, be it resolved that community as a whole is hereby received the draft administration monetary penalty system bylaw for the town of Bancroft for discussion purposes. Mover and a seconder, moved by Wayne, seconded by John. All those in favor? Uh, Carrie, thank you very much. Thanks, Sandra. Thank you. Um, are, are you speaking on the next one, the uh, North Hastings Public Library Battery Second Program, or, or who is? I can speak to that. Okay, thanks, Amber. Do you want to put it on the table? Sure, it will. Okay. Be it resolved that the community of the whole does hereby receive the North Hastings Public Library Battery Recycling Program report for information purposes only. A mover and a seconder again. Moved by Tracy and, and seconded by Barry Given. Go ahead. Okay, so this report is brought forward uh, from an inquiry at the February 8th Council meeting regarding the library's battery recycling program. Uh, so the library is in partnership with a company called Raw Materials Company, and the library acts as a depot for the collection of used batteries. And when the, con the collection container is full uh, at the library, the Raw Materials Company picks the barrel up and is responsible for the transportation, recycling, and reporting on the collection of these batteries. Good. Any questions on for, for uh, is that John? You've got a question? Uh, just, just uh, I was reading about uh, the battery uh, collection in, in some of the uh, U United States uh, EPA standards, and the only concern I would have is that you do have to be careful about how you actually bring these batteries together, because in fact you can create a fire hazard by doing it. And uh, apparently, different kinds of, of batteries uh, behave differently under different conditions. Like the button battery apparently has got certain chemicals and so forth. I guess my point is that, I, I mean, months ago I heard that in fact, I shouldn't just throw my batteries in the drawer because in fact, potentially if the terminals come together the wrong way, you could create a fire. 
with that in mind, I'm just concerned about the initial holding of the batteries outside the library and whether there's any special need or whether Pat Hoover or somebody needs to think about the way in which they're being held. So I wonder, so they do require that you tape the ends of the battery. I'm not sure if that is um, to do with the storing of them. I would have to follow up on that, if that's the reasoning for that. Okay, that's the only question I have. I think the program is great, but I just want to make sure that, in fact, when it's done, that there is no potential hazard that comes out of it, that's all. Okay. Thank you, Amber. Uh, oh, oh, Wayne, you got a question? Yeah, uh, question for Perry, if I might. Uh, I see here that they, they uh, it's a revenue source for the library to uh, recycle these batteries. Um, at hazardous waste days, uh, myself, that's when I, I keep my batteries and take them down that day, and I think a lot of people do. Uh, I'm just wondering, is Perry, or were you aware, or can you become part of this uh, raw material that uh, finances, or are you ready uh, finances from the way you're doing it? Um, Councillor Wiggins, I, we can investigate and reach out to this uh, raw materials company to see if there's some type of uh, working partnership we could work with them. I know through the uh, uh, through the program that we use right now, there is a fee for all of the material that is picked up at the waste site, but then we're compensated through uh, different agencies that we partner with annually. So I do believe there is still a fee for the municipality to have these household events held. Uh, three or four times a year. Um, but again, it's more of uh, making certain that the, the materials don't enter into the waste site. I, oh, I agree. And I think it's a great thing that the library has that, but a library is a is a, only a portion of our residents that, that do take stuff to the hazardous waste day. And if always, if there's a revenue source, it'd be nice if we can do it down there also. But I'll leave that in your hands to investigate. But it's a well, great thing. Yeah. The other the other comment is that uh, our waste site is approved as a uh, to be a household hazardous waste depot, and what that would mean is that uh, over at the old uh, public works yard, we had a depot set up there that we could uh, collect and store all hazardous materials uh, within a certain within a locked compound. Um, that's something that uh, I am investigating as well at the waste site that would be something there on a more permanent basis too as well. So the more product we have uh, the day of our event, um, the more chance there is that we would become more revenue neutral when the material is all being picked up rather than being just on that day alone. Um, that would it would possibly benefit the municipality to have that depot there uh, for use at all times. Hey, thanks, Barry. Um, okay, that at least been moved and it's been seconded. All those in favor? Okay, that's carried. Thank you very much. Uh, other business. The, the only thing I'd like to mention on the other business is I think we should send a, um, a letter. We should ask council to send a letter to our uh, MPP, Daryl Crap. I understand he's not going to be running in, in this coming provincial election. And I think he's got over 20 some years within the government, uh, federal and provincial. So I, if, if we could, uh, if, if it's, uh, if we could make a resolution saying to send a letter of congratulations on his retirement from council, would that be okay, Amber? Yeah, I would just need a mover and seconder and we can bring it forward to council for consideration. Okay, you got uh, Val and uh, Wayne Wick. All those in favor? Carried, thank you very much. Anything else? Anyone else have anything for other business? Uh, Wayne? Uh, Andra, um, this, today we canceled our, our uh, buildings bylaw meeting uh, Due to uh, certain circumstances, our our fire chief's away and our mayor's away. So, but at the same time, uh, the, the Amber had a, a a little bit of an update. I thought she might provide. 
Uh, for that, Amber? Okay, there you are. Sorry. I can do that. So uh, one of the items for discussion was the AMPS bylaw on the agenda for the meeting this morning, and I knew I was bringing it here. So uh, we covered that off for here. Uh, with regard to building reviews, um, Grant Thornton's team will be on site in the municipality uh, on a couple of days this week to physically visit all of the buildings associated with town operations. Uh, to complete an inventory of sorts about the status of the building, how old is the roof, what kind of insulation does it has, how is it heated, are the windows single pane, double pane, thermal pane, uh, that kind of stuff, which will all um, come back to council in March for that efficiency grant that we approved them to uh, implement at council in January. So again, we're gonna have more information on that in the form of a report in a couple of weeks. So it didn't really make sense to chat about those things today. And then things like the security cameras are, have been pushed forward to budget for consideration. And we hope to have that budget ready for preliminary review at the end of February or beginning of March for council to see. So some of those issues will be addressed there as well. So um, after consulting with, uh, with Mr. Wiggins, who chairs that committee. Um, it was my recommendation that since pretty much all of the items were being covered off either in this meeting today or would be at council uh, in, in a couple weeks that we postpone today's meeting. Thank you, Andre. Okay, and, and the, uh, the only uh, thing I would suggest or say too was <clears throat> the um, Community Safety and Wellbeing Committee meeting was, I canceled it as of, of a couple of days ago, uh, really there wasn't much on the agenda other than uh, we were the, the discussion with the uh, updated plan for our own community safety and well-being plan. So if, if any of you have any new comments to make on that, if you could uh, either send them to me or send them to, to Amber, who you're looking after that. Does anyone else have any other business? Uh, Perry? Uh, yes. Uh, uh... Chair Mullet, just a couple of items for everyone's interest. Uh, we did discover that water break on Thursday afternoon and uh, through uh, everyone's hard efforts, we worked through uh, Friday and all day Saturday. We're nine or 10 hours without any success, but uh, we ended up using uh, two Vacuumax trucks today uh, with an excavator uh, to work around the brand new bell fiber that was installed plus the existing encased uh, bell fiber and concrete because uh, we couldn't just dig an open hole to find it. One of the frustrating parts with this water break was it was on a hill and we ended up chasing it from where it come out of the ground on the hill. So it uh, it's frustrating as well for us because we know time is money and you know water's pumping out on the ground that we've already processed but uh, um, through the mitigation process we ended up uh, doing that repair anyways. And the, um, when those water breaks happen, uh, it takes a, a large toll on our contracted services that we pay out to our uh, annual operating budget. So it's uh, the sooner we can get something like that tidied up and fixed up, the better off we all are. Um, and even with the, the rainstorms, uh, this rainstorm this afternoon, we were set to send our staff home, but uh, instead we ended up putting them out on the road and they're fully chained up and you know, it's uh, kind of uh, good after bad because we're sending them out to sand, even though the sand is being washed off of the roads with the amount of rain that we're going to have. So, you know, by 10, 11 o'clock tonight, our staff will be tired out, but they'll uh, they'll have to stay out and keep the roads open for us. So um, we can't just even on this one, just put one round of sand and say, we've done our due diligence and go home because it's... Uh, it's a continued event and uh, just rest assured if you get any calls and uh, we have staff out making sure that the uh, the roads are in the best and the safest condition that we can. Good. Thanks, Perry. Um, we, have we do have, don't forget we have a council meeting next. Um, so Amber, do you want us just to adjourn this meeting and then move into council? Yep, that would be great, please. Okay. so. Uh, next meeting of council is the 22nd of March at 3 o'clock via Zoom. Uh, adjournment. Who's going to make the adjournment? Councilor Wiggins. Okay. We're adjourned. <laughs>
Now I've got to have time to find my uh, agenda for the council. If I can find it. We all set again. Okay, ready to open the agenda meeting of council February the 22nd, 2022. Uh, call to order and adoption of open session agenda. Be it resolved, the council of the corporation of the town of Bancroft is hereby approved of the open session agenda dated February 22nd, 2022 as presented. Okay, a move and a seconder, please. John is moved and Tracy seconded. All those in favor? That's carried, thank you. Declaration of pecuniary interest and in nature thereof, is there any? Don't see any, thank you. Business, sale of 24 Flint Avenue. Be it resolved that council approved the proposed sale of 24 Flint Avenue more particularly described as plan 411, lot 134 to 135 SPT to Bancroft Community Transit for a purchase price of $300,000 and that a bylaw be passed to authorize the mayor and clerk to execute the agreement of purchase and sale within the next 90 days and the transfer documents that may be required. A mover and a seconder, please. Moved by uh, Councillor Wiggins, seconded by Councillor uh, Miles. Any discussion? We've talked about this previously. No discussion, everybody's fine. Okay, we'll ask the question. All those in favor? Carrie, thank you very much. Confirming by law. First, second, and third reading be it resolved that a bylaw can confirm the proceedings of the meeting of council held on February 22nd, 2022. Be hereby given a first, second, and third reading, and be finally passed, signed, sealed, and numbered bylaw number 24-22022. A mover and a seconder, please. Uh, moved and seconded by uh, Barry and Tracy McGibbon. All those in favor? Care, okay, thank you very much. Next meeting date is uh, March the 8th at 3 p.m. via Zoom. Thank you, everyone, for uh, being here and attending, and good meeting. Thank you. Take care. Oh, and who's going to do the adjournment? Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you.